We want more Monster Hunter content. If you don't post more Monster Hunter videos I will unsubscribe. Get your stupid video game essays out of here boy if it ain't Monster Hunter it's irrelevant. Monster I subscribe Hunter, for Monster, Monster Hunter, Hunter, Hunter and nothing Hunter, else. Monster Hunter, Monster When's the Hunter, next Monster Hunter, Hunter video? Monster Hunter, Monster Hunter, Monster I have heard your cries and now I am officially back with some more Monster Hunter content. I wanted to take a small break from. I want nothing more than to be. All right, close to you we get it. I'm talking standing. now. I wanted to take a small break from Elden Ring, as you can probably imagine why. Uh, and I always enjoy talking about Monster Hunter. I just like balancing out my content. But I made a video about the most broken armor sets in Monster Hunter history a few months ago, so you know it makes sense that I follow up with the weapons. Not gonna lie, it's not my favorite video. Not exactly proud of it. Of course, out of the few videos I'm not exactly proud of, it's my number one video on the channel. That's life, I guess. But I do appreciate the feedback a lot, actually, and I hope this video makes up for it. Now, I want to make something clear because I didn't even define it in my last video like an idiot. Uh, what I mean by the term broken is if a weapon or weapon class is stronger than it should be, or it is the best weapon of a Monster Hunter game at a certain point in time. In the end, I'm not going to crown the best weapon or weapons of Monster Hunter, I'm gonna just display what I think are the most powerful weapons, leave that choice up to you, with my personal opinion taped at the very end. And with all of that out of the way, my name is Josh, and I hope you enjoy the video. Slime weapons! We know them! Everyone had fun slinging slime onto monsters' faces and blowing their load all over. Yes, that sounds weird, I get it. But let me break down as to why slime weapons were busted. So first of all, Slime had a very low tolerance when compared to other statuses, and let me explain. Tolerance is how much resistance a monster has to a certain status ailment. So let's say, for example, you paralyze a Narcacuga for the first time. It's going to take much longer to paralyze said Narcacuga again because now it has gained tolerance to paralysis. Now, Slime has a much slower rate when it comes to tolerance, increasing by 40 to 75 each explosion, while other statuses increase by 50 to 170. This means you're going to see much more explosions on a Nargakuga than Paralysis, in simplistic terms. So it happens more often. Next, let's talk about the damage. The average damage for each explosion is roughly 200, which for low and high rank is a considerable chunk, but not as much for G rank. Still though, with how little tolerance most monsters have to slime, it's still a formidable weapon regardless. However, I should probably mention that when it comes to the end game of 3 Ultimate, it was mostly elemental or raw builds that made the cut. With only a few slime weapons here and there competing with the best, like Brachydeus' greatsword or Urigan's hammer with the free element skill. Still, in the middle of high rank and to the beginning of G rank, Brachydeus' weapons were incredibly broken. Combined with their high raw, explosions, and skills like Bombardier that increase the damage, and Feline Pyro Up which increases the rate at which the explosions happened, yeah, you can see why everyone was using these weapons at a certain point in time. These weapons were much stronger than they should have been, and then they got severely nerfed in 4 Ultimate to the point where nobody was using them. Like, to give you an idea, the medium damage for Slime in 3 Ultimate was 200. In 4 Ultimate, it was cut in half, so those explosions only did 100 points of damage. Unfortunate, but at least we had fun in 3 Ultimate, I guess. Speaking of Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, let's talk about the newest weapons introduced in this game, the Charge Blade and the Insect Glaive. Now, both of these weapons were overpowered in their own right, and I'll start with my favorite weapon in the series, the Charge Blade. There's a few things that make this weapon overpowered, specifically in 4 Ultimate. Now, let me break down the damage calculations when it comes to the files. The damage increase caps at 1.4, so you could use Artillery God or Artillery Novice and eat for Bombardier, you would get the same results. Now, these boosts only apply to impact charge blades, as elemental charge blades are purely elemental. Remember, sharpness has no say in the matter when it comes to the damage that files do. Hence why the Akantor Charge Blade was popular for some time because it had incredible physical damage. For Impact Charge Blades, the basic attack files was your true raw times .05. So on your basic swings, you did damage with the swing itself and then the file damage on top of that. By the way, let's get something clear. True raw is calculated by taking the display number on your weapon and dividing it by the type specific multiplier. Just so you understand what's going on here. With a supercharged attack, your files did true raw times 0.1 times 3, because, you know, 3 files. 
For elemental charge blades, your file damage was your element times 3, and your super attack was your element times 4.5 times 3. Which is ridiculous damage, especially for 4 ultimate, but it gets even more absurd. When you charge your shield, you get an additional damage modifier. So for impact, charging your shield gave you an additional 1.33 increase, and elemental was 1.35. And so what about the super mega big boy attack? The, whatever, the big one. This attack could easily knock out a monster first try if you landed most of your files. For impact files, it does true raw times 0.33 times the number of files that landed, which is 5 or 6 if you had a capacity boost. Oh yeah, by the way, each file during that attack did 100 KO damage. So to put that into perspective, Raytheon's first threshold when you start the quest for a KO is 150. You land two of those Mega Busters on her face, and she's already KO'd in the first two minutes. It is insane. For Elemental Charge Blades, the Ultra Slammer was your element times 13.5 times the number of files, which is absolutely absurd. Again, to give you some perspective, if you had a Charge Blade with 450 element, you divide your element by 10, and that's the damage it does in-game, so 45, plugging in the 1.35 modifier for a Charge Shield and doing the Ultra Attack, that's about 4100 damage, without counting hit zones. Typical hit zones involved at around 30% weakness, you're doing a good 1200 damage easily. Like there's a reason why the Charge Blade was so popular back then, because you could buff yourself to oblivion and knock out a monster with your first ultra attack, or deal crazy elemental damage. It was extremely powerful, it was versatile, and it was also defensive with your guard points and shield bash. Nothing could really compete with the Charge Blade and 4 ultimate, nothing except for the Insect Glaive. Thankfully, the Insect Glaive is not as hard to decipher. It's very simple. Now, the Insect Glaive was broken for two reasons. The first one is it utilized the most broken mechanic in 4 Ultimate, mounting. You can jump effortlessly into the air at the cost of some stamina and deal mounting attacks. Some monsters like Gravios killed over from the first attack. It was that good. Not to mention, Star Knight Mail gave you Rodeo God, so it was even easier. That's the first reason. The second reason is that this weapon also buffed your character. By shooting your Kinsect and missing most of your shots trying to get the attack buff, you get four new buffs. Attack up large, defense up large, higher mobility, and earplugs. Now this is only if you grab all three different essences that a monster can provide. There's also healing, but like, nobody really cares about that. Otherwise you get like smaller buffs like attack up or defense up small. Not to mention that your attack patterns evolved when grabbing the red essence from a monster, and these buffs lasted for a good while, which really didn't matter because it was really easy to replenish. With the Insect Glaive, you can certainly take care of most monsters by yourself, but when fighting with a team, oh yeah, the basic strategy back then was just to spam the mounting attacks and get a mount every 5 seconds. And it worked. Either way, the Insect Glaive was abusable, and even without the mounting capabilities, those buffs are nothing to laugh at. Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. This is an interesting one, um, and as a quick disclaimer, my knowledge when it comes to GU is very limited, considering I haven't beaten the game. I've asked a few people, you know, on Discord, on the internet, on what they think the best weapons in GU are, and so here's a small list of those weapons and weapon classes. Feel free to include your own opinions, and let me know if I was incorrect with my research. Now, I tried approaching GU like I did the other games, but that's not gonna work, considering this Monster Hunter game has styles and arts. It's very different, which, depending on the weapon you use, can be absolutely busted. Valor Longsword is a splendid example. If you've played Sekiro, then you know that this game is all about countering and parrying a boss's combos. Th that is, if you can do it. The Valor Longsword is very similar in the sense that when you're in Valor style, the first hit of your spirit combo acts as a counter. So if you know how to use it properly, it can become a devastating tool. I've seen people take zero points of damage because they counter everything. It's really strong. Now the best longsword, based on what people say, is the Rust Razor Splitter. This longsword has amazing white sharpness, with handicraft it can boost it to purple, good raw, some affinity. You know, and it's great, and it doesn't have an element, so you can use this against anything. Not to mention, since it's a deviant weapon, it charges your art gauges faster. But then there's also the Valor Heavy Bow Gun. Now, I don't usually use guns. Actually, in fact, I don't think I've ever wielded a bow gun in my life. Um, call me old-fashioned if you want, but I've heard that Valor Heavy Bow Gun is actually cheating in this game. 
From what I've seen, you can dash faster than hunters who have their weapons sheathed. So already you have insane mobility. That's a good start. There's also this siege mode that bypasses whatever you have in the chamber apparently, giving you extra ammo after each roll or dash, which means you really don't have to reload. You know, something that guns usually do. Let's not forget the Valor Dodge, which is really good, but apparently you can quickly press the reload button to cancel the sheathing animation, keeping your weapon out for retaliation. So, okay, there's manipulation involved with this weapon, which I've seen work, and it's ridiculous. It has to be the most broken combination in Generations Ultimate. I, like, let me see if I have this right. Valor Heavy Bowgun allows you to have insane mobility with its dashing properties in Valor style, you can cancel the sheathing animation by pressing reload with the Valor Dodge, allowing you to keep on attacking essentially, insane damage output, considering you never have to reload, and you also have incredible range, cause, you know, gun. What's crazy to me is that there is like no cost to using all of these advantages. Not that there usually are in these games, but Heavy Bowgun alone has many advantages, and this is even before considering the best Heavy Bowgun in the game. I'm not sure which one it is, but I've heard that the Zenogre Heavy Bowgun is really good since he has great pierce shots, but let me know if I'm wrong. I could also talk about Otto Ka's weapons, you know, great purple sharpness, many slots, great versatility, and easy to use with many builds, but I don't feel like it's a great representation of Generations Ultimate. You know, Valor Heavy Bowgun and Longsword utilize the core aspect of GU. The main difference that separates this game from the other Monster Hunter games, which are styles and arts, and I think they are much stronger than Atoka weapons alone. Certainly overpowered if you know how to use it. Valor Anything is the meta of Generations Ultimate, but the specific weapon varies from monster to monster and person to person. But what stays the same is the use of Valor Style. So, yeah, Valor Style for the win, man. If you ask me, I think the perfect Monster Hunter game would be a game similar to Iceborne, but with the styles and arts of Generations Ultimate. The combination of those two I think would work beautifully together, but that's just me. But now we actually get to talk about my favorite Monster Hunter game, Monster Hunter World Iceborne. So this specific Monster Hunter game suffered from a severe power creep issue, meaning that most new monsters that were released had the best gear in the game until the next one came out. Uh, the final monster added to the roster was, of course, the infamous Fatalis, but we'll get to him shortly. I want to first talk about two other monsters with powerful weapons at their point in time, starting with Kul Taroth. Now, when Master and Kul Taroth came out, uh, she provided weapons at the end of every siege that had a complete variety of elements and statuses. These weapons were so diverse that pretty much everyone was using them, because you could use them. Anyone can. My favorites that I got personally were the Kajar Sword Paralysis and the Kajar Axe Stream. They're very nice. These weapons had some extra defense, affinity, and decent raw, but what really made them powerful was the skill that they provided. One of the rarest things in Monster Hunter is finding someone that likes Kezu, but the other one is having a weapon that comes with a skill. And the Kajar weapons came with critical element or status. Normally you would think this wouldn't be like a crazy good skill, but actually it was not bad at all. Because the meta in Iceborne at the time was all about critical hits, weakness exploit, critical eye, critical boost, and to have a weapon that increased your elemental damage per critical hit made your build all the more powerful. Probably wasn't anything too significant, but I mean, it's not gonna hurt, you know? The goal was to get good weapons for your build, and with some RNG, you did. It wasn't too hard, and you got a lot of weapons if you broke her horns and killed her successfully. But what holds her back in my opinion is the RNG, and not to mention other monsters that came out after her. But you had to get lucky to actually get the weapon you wanted to use, but she was a lot of fun to me, so I didn't really care. Now the next monster I want to discuss is none other than Safi Jiva. Anyways, his weapons without question have the greatest customizable options in Iceborne. You see, there was a leveling system involved using Dracolite Shards, and you could choose to either select an available upgrade or store the potential for something better. When you reach a certain awakening level, the weapon would change and then the skills that you could harvest were absolutely broken. I'll share some examples on screen of some of the weapons I have personally, and you could just tell that there was so much potential. There were five slots, five slots to do whatever you want. You could even acquire set bonuses, such as Volcana Divinity. For example, normally you would have to put on two pieces of Volcana's armor to get Critical Element, or four pieces for Frostcraft. 
With this greatsword, now I only need one piece for critical element, or three for frostcraft, allowing for opportunities for more skills and different combinations. These weapons, if you got the right upgrades and combined them with certain armor sets that they mixed well with, their potential was phenomenal. The problem here is that you have to rely again on RNG to get the weapon you want first, and then you have to farm Dracolite shards from Safi Jiva to upgrade them properly, because you couldn't upgrade them normally. Not really that big of a deal if what weapon you receive is an absolute powerhouse, it was worth the grind. And then all that grinding went to waste because then Fatalis came out. And now all I see, even today, are Fatalis weapons, rightfully so. So funny enough, Fatalis weapons don't have any skills like Kajar or crazy customization like Safi Jiva. So then the question then becomes, why are they considered some of the best weapons in Iceborne? Remember what I said in the beginning, how Iceborne had a power creep issue? This also applies for armor sets, and Fatalis without question has the best armor set in the entire game. Therefore, you want a good weapon to go along with the set. Fatalis armor is all about raw strength, physical power, critical hits, disregarding all elemental advantages. So you're gonna need a weapon that has high raw potential. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, Fatalis weapons have the highest raw damage in the entire game. And when you combine that with a Fatalis set that has skills dedicated towards affinity and raw damage, you're gonna see some big numbers. Fatalis weapons actually don't have the best sharpness, but with Handicraft that's on the Fatalis armor set anyway, now you have crazy purple sharpness that barely chips away. At least with my set, I, I could fight a Fatalis three times without needing a whetstone. But that's more so the armor set than it is the weapon. The thing is, Fatalis weapons have terrible affinity, so you would think that they would be bad, but not really. Again, the meta is all about critical damage, and with endgame stats, you could easily surpass 100% affinity, making minus 30% affinity not really that big of a deal. At all. Elemental damage was also crazy strong in Iceborne 2, don't get me wrong, but endgame sets like Fatalis cater towards raw builds, and Fatalis weapons are the best of the bunch, making them the most used weapons in the endgame. Because they're based around raw damage too, and not any sort of element, you can use them against anything you want, and Fatalis weapons will dominate, easily. This is without mentioning augmentations, by the way. The healing augmentation is my favorite because with a greatsword, I essentially don't have to heal. Let's not forget that 4 Ultimate also had augmentations, but there was a more noticeable difference in Iceborne. So those are the best weapons that I've gathered for you guys here today. And if you ask me, the best weapon I would probably have to say is Valor Heavy Bowgun. But that's just my opinion. You're probably wondering, by the way, why I didn't talk about Rise. If you look through my list, I talked about the ultimate versions or the expansions. Um, I know Rise is getting its expansion soon, but within the base game, I don't really see anything that dominates the end game. I mean, Hunting Horn is pretty strong. It got a it got a decent buff, but I don't really know. You guys can let me know in the comment section down below. But thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this video was at least a bit better than my previous one. Um, yeah, don't worry, Monster content is not going anywhere. It'll just be in between other content that I want to make. Elden Ring videos are coming soon. Other video game essays just all around will also be coming as well. And yeah, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. And if you did enjoy this video, be sure to leave a like and to subscribe for more content like this. And I'll see you in the next video. Take care everyone, and of course, stay safe.